Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Chestermere Christian Fellowship. Just, yeah, glad to see everyone here today, and uh, welcome to those who uh, will watch it online later. Oh yeah, we're uh, we're celebrating the the first Sunday. A lot, a lot of things going on. Celebrating the first Sunday in Advent um, today, and also uh, next week we've got some baptisms going on and some events. So it's a it's a blessed time. And so I'm going to start out. This is the call to worship. I'm going to read from Romans 8, just about the final five, six verses. This is the salvation that we celebrate. And if you know Romans and just kind of how the structure goes, Romans 8 is sort of the most triumphant celebratory um, of of the verses in there, starting out, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then Paul goes on and on about that. But I'm going to jump in at verse 31 here. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Don't just jump a verse. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I know that's a whole big bundle there, but that's our, celebra- that's our salvation. And that's what we celebrate. It's the love of God that saved us. The love of God shown in the, on the cross through the death of Jesus Christ. And so I'm just going to open in prayer and just uh, offer up this, this service to the Lord. And then the, the praise team will lead us in our first three songs. So Father God, what a mighty salvation you've given us. Lord, you've blessed us, you've loved us, you've rescued us, you've saved us through the death of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, you've gathered us today. And Lord, we want to offer up our worship to you this morning. Lord, we want to open up our hearts, Lord, and just pour out our, our love, our gratitude, our adoration, and our praise to you. Lord. And just pray, Lord, just, uh, yeah, that your Holy Spirit would guide us in this, Lord. Your Holy Spirit would be present and be an authority in this worship service. Bless the team, Lord, as they uh, lead us in these songs, Lord. And may everything we do be fitting and acceptable in your sight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. We're going to start with a couple of uh, Christmas carols. Uh, in fact, we could sing these any time of year. We don't have to be any special time. But today, join me. Would you stand, please? Joy to the world. And joy to the world. Oh. 
wonderful love he has. Hallelujah. Come all ye faithful. Oh, we're faithful this morning. Show up and we praise the Lord and lift up our voices loud. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Come all ye faithful. Oh, come all ye faithful. adore him. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, and worship Worship is holy. 
worship your holy name. Yes, we'll worship your holy name. Yes, we will, Lord. Bless you. Yeah, we'll just do some announcements now. So parents with younger children, there's a, a room available downstairs if you, if you need that for just uh, child care. And next, please. Yeah, prayer night, as usual, on Tuesday. We'll, uh, we'll gather, we'll pray, as we did last Tuesday. Uh, everyone is welcome. We usually get 5, 10, 11, 12 people, sing a few songs, and then just pray about needs that we know of in the congregation, needs in our world, and just our own personal things that we share. So encourage you to come out for that. Uh, the Women's Bible Study is continuing to meet at 9.30. I don't see Nola, but yes, that's... Uh, it's going again on, uh, on Wednesday. All right, tonight, uh, it's at 6.30, we're just going to gather for worship, and let's keep it simple. We'll worship for about 30 minutes, and then, as, um, then we'll come up and just do any kind of prayer or declaration of Scripture that you want to do, just as the Holy Spirit has stirred you up and led you. Then I will preach a message of about 10 minutes or less, and then we'll finish just with... Uh, with worship and prayer for anyone who needs prayer. And I just, the goal tonight is just to kind of have, just have a free kind of experience where I just, I have a playlist made, so one song will go after the other. Um, it's a lot of Chris Tomlin, um, which was good for me, um, which, anyway, which I prefer, but I, I appreciate his lyrics as well too, that they're like deep, worshipful words of truth. And so the lyrics will be up on the screen. You'll be there, you can stand, you can sit, you can dance, you can fall on your face, however you're led. Um, yeah, as a, that, that's, that's fine anyway. Just want to have a freedom to worship tonight and then a freedom also to come up here and just pray publicly and declare scriptures. So, and we'll be done around 7.30. If we go to 7.45, I don't mind. Okay, so hopefully that's clear. I know there's a lot of details, but I hope it's a simple night where we just come and worship the Lord. Yeah, so next Saturday, a lot of you are already engage in this because a lot of you have uh, signed up to buy a gift for one of the, the children who will be attending. So if you are coming, if you could let the office know just so we have a general idea of numbers. Everyone is welcome, whether you've bought a gift or not, um, just to come on out. It's organized by Pastor Maurice. I know we did it last year, and I hear it was a great success. Um, so this is my first time there. But just, uh, yeah, an inter a Middle Eastern Christmas. Food will be provided, and that's why we want to know numbers. So, um, Encourage you to come out for that. And yes, so we have four people who are going to be baptized next week. So looking forward to that. We'll do it. Yeah, praise God. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, I, I can announce the, the, the names too, just because to, people maybe wonder. So uh, as I find them, people, okay, so Donna Gibson, okay, and Cindy Siddons, yes. And Lawrence, and behind me, Joanne. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So they will be doing their, their public declaration of, uh, of giving their lives to Christ, and we'll witness that. And uh, amen. Yeah. I guess we haven't had a, a baptism in a few years since pre-COVID. So that's going on. Yeah, so... Uh, and then the potluck, that's Saturday, December 10th, so two weeks from yesterday... And I'm not sure how that organization works, honestly, even though I'm the announcement guy in terms of who's buying, who's bringing, you know, A to M a dessert or something like that. But more details to follow. I'm sure other people are on top of that. But uh, it's in the bulletin. There you go. <laughs> See? It's, the information is there. There's many things going on. I'm glad we're... See, teamwork. I love this. Okay. And the Sunday School Christmas play will be on... Uh, Sunday, December 18th, so a week before Christmas. And we're doing it also at the Christmas Eve service. We'll do a candlelight service on December 24th. So there'll be two showings of the, of the Sunday School Christmas Story presentation. Okay. Oh, that came out in yellow. Um, just a word about Bible studies, the reason why I put this up here. 
So there's, there's been a men's fellowship going on, which has gone well, uh, on Wednesday mornings. And there's the women's Bible study also on Wednesday mornings. And I know sometimes we offer Bible studies and things, and it just doesn't fit your schedule. You can't make Wednesday morning. You can't make, uh, you know, Tuesday night or whatever. And I would just encourage you, like, as a, as a church, we do want to offer and organize things like Bible studies. But I want to say this in the best of ways. You don't need us necessarily for it. You are quite welcome and encouraged to, to host a Bible study of your own. And you can invite people from the church, or you can invite your neighbors or other Christian friends. And so I just wanted to, for the new year to think of this, we have Bible studies of all these topics um, available. They're just a, a series that I bought for the church, and so they're all available on PDF. They all, uh, yeah, they're all well prepared, so it takes some, some looking at it beforehand. But if you want to do this in your own home, um, please, uh, you know, talk to me or you know, pick a topic or pray about it or consider it. It's something you might even want to plan for the new year. I know December is busy, but starting in January, yeah, let's have a, you know, and some of these are, are four or five lessons. I want to do Malachi, by the way. I've kind of shotgunned that for, for Tuesday nights alternating, um, but you can do Malachi in your home or whatever. So um, those are available. So just hear both messages. We want to organize things as a church and the leadership, um, but you don't have to be dependent on us either if you're keen to start one of these. So please take that to heart. And yeah, for, for cleaners, so this is our turn. Our, every third month, our church does the cleaning for the church. There's a clipboard. I think it's in the foyer for signing up for that. Okay. Birthdays. Oh, wow. Okay, so we have Marilyn and where's Anne Mayenne? On... On the 28th, so Marilyn tomorrow and Mayan on Wednesday. Wednesday. Okay, please stand and we're going to sing to you. You have to stand. <laughs> yes. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God loves you. Happy birthday to you and you. Amen. Hey, and is that it? Oh, and the offering, too. So uh, there are multiple ways to give. You can give online e-transfer through ccfdonations at gmail.com, and there's also a good old-fashioned offering box in the back as well, too, if you'd like to leave your contribution there. And so, just before we get back into worship, I'm just going to give thanks and pray for the offering. We're a, by God's grace, we're a healthy financial church, and so uh, there's not a lot of struggles or worries. There's still, yeah, decisions we have to make, but God has blessed us. So I'm going to give thanks to him for that and encourage, um, encourage you as well. So God, thank you for your goodness to us, Lord, and thank you for your word, which encourages us. That if we are generous uh, to, to you and to others and to the poor, Lord, then you are generous to us. So, Lord, help us to have willing hearts. Help us to be cheerful givers. Help us to trust you with provision, Lord. We want to be good stewards of what you've given us, Lord. And Lord, I pray you'd bless and encourage all the givers, Lord. Those who are generous, Lord. Um, Lord, we trust that you will reward them. Your word says you reward them in secret when they give in secret, Lord. So thank you for that, Lord. And teach us to be more uh, yeah, more willing and open with our resources, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Let's stand again and uh, give thanks to our God. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever, for He is good, He is above all things, His love endures forever, sing praise, sing praise, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, His love
of God will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us forever. 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 Amen. John twelve thirty two says, and this is Jesus speaking, if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. All women too. We're all together in this. Praising the Lord. So this be lifted up. I don't know if you heard this one before, but listen. Just take time to lift him up. Be lifted up. Bless your holy name. From the first song to the last song, Father, you are the one that we honor, we adore, and we lift up. Because forever, Lord, you are faithful. Lord, we can trust in you. And as we come, lift our hearts and our voices to you, Father. Our expectations are high. We wait expectantly for God to 
move in our hearts that will cause us to say, oh God, I sense your presence. I sense, Lord, that you are just touching me, urging me on to get closer, urging me on. Get closer, come nearer, come nearer. Sense the power of the Holy Spirit that ministers to you when you open your heart. Oh, the joy that fills my soul when the Spirit of the living God comes alongside and gives you that spiritual, spiritual hug that says, you're my child. My child, says God. Ah, great and wonderful is the one we serve. And we bless you, Lord, and we lift you up. All our voices can do is lift you up. And our hearts just come and say, you are Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is the congregational prayer. And then after that, I'll release the children for Sunday school. But then after that, we're going to do the, the lighting of the Advent candle and the reading. So um, something we haven't done yet. And then uh, the message after that will bring the message. So yeah, as, as we sang, our, our God is a great and mighty and awesome God and the earth trembles and and the Lord says, uh, once more, I will shake everything that can be shaken. So we have a God who, who can shake the earth. But that's also good news when we come to him in prayer. We bring a request before him. Because if he can shake the earth, okay, then he can intervene in our lives with the, with the situations we are dealing with. Uh, this, I think it's in Numbers, the Lord says to Moses, is the Lord's arm too short? Like, is there something he can't do? Um, so that's why we come to him in prayer. So I, I know of a few, few things already going on, uh, where Mark and Donna have lost a cousin, right? uh, Chris, back in Windsor, Ontario, so uh, uh, Friday, was it? Friday? Okay. So, yeah, pray for that family um, who's grieving. And there was uh, someone else. Um, Krista spoke to you. You um, you lost an aunt. Okay. Oh, sorry, your aunt's husband. Okay, so and what's his name? Jerry. Jerry, thank you, Jerry. And her name? Uh, Katie. Katie, thank you. We'll just pray for her and for the family. Sure, yeah. We're here to pray. Okay. Scott? Okay. So Scott, the, uh, the brother-in-law of Krista's best friend, just lost his older brother in a in an accident, and is, uh, yeah, not, we understand, not doing well to, to lose a brother so abruptly, so suddenly. So we'll pray for Scott and the whole family. Okay, Suzanne? Yeah. Okay, yeah, we'll pray, yeah, that all is well in your body, that, that God will heal you fully. Yeah, Suzanne just having a CT scan. She, as maybe some of you know, about a few weeks ago, she slipped and fell on the ice and kind of hit hard. And we're just praying for a full healing and recovery from that so there's nothing left over. Uh, David. Lance. 
Lois? Okay. Okay, right. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Just thinking, um, yeah, John 11, verse 35, and, uh, and getting ahead to my sermon too, but at, at Lazarus' tomb, um, Jesus wept. Like, so Jesus grieved over the loss of a loved one and a friend too. So um, yeah, anyway, just probably come into my prayer. Does that be part of the comfort we have, that we have a God who understands these things? Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Lynn Dinnigan, okay. Right. Okay. And I didn't hear this story, but but he's he's alive. He's alive. Okay. He's shot through the head. Yes, that, which is not small. Wow. Okay. Wow. It. It's what God can do. So. Right, okay. Trevor was shot, and his mom, Lynn, as well, too, your neighbor. Okay. For sure. Uh, yes, Dolores. Thank you for the testimony. So it is, I think maybe most of you heard, but we give thanks for Sam and Dolores with the, the family visiting. They needed a, a seven-passenger vehicle for while they're there, and they, they sent out the word, and, and God answered prayer. Well, he doubly answered, even though you only need one. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, teach us to believe and teach us to ask. Let us ask in faith, for sure. Okay, let's come to our God in prayer. Father God, we, we love you, we worship you. you, you're a good, good father. You know how to give good gifts to your children, Lord, and, and uh, the, the encouragement to us, Lord, is that sometimes we just have to ask, Lord, that we ask and you will give. We ask in Jesus' name and you will give to us, Lord. And so, uh, Lord, there's many, uh, there's many situations which we bring before you, Lord, that just some, I know that there's small situations and there's much bigger situations. But God, as, as we say, you are greater than every one of these situations. And so, Lord, we just bring them up to you, Lord. Some, some heavy ones, Lord. I, just, I think of those who are grieving, Lord. I just think of, um, of, of, of uh, Donna and Mark uh, losing their cousin Chris. Lord, but also for, for Chris's mom, Lois, who has now lost three children. Um, three children which have predeceased her. Lord. And so, God of all comfort, as you are called in, in your word, Lord, Lord, I pray you provide comfort and peace uh, in that situation, Lord. I pray you would bring the family together, Lord. I pray to bring the family together that, that we'd be able to grieve and grieve in a healthy way, Lord, and come together as well, and just, um, even just physically and geographically, Lord. I pray for, uh, for Chris's children to be able to, to be gathered um, with Chris's widow as, as, um, in, uh, in Ontario, Lord, and just pray for your grace and peace there, Lord. Just bring the family together. Lord, send your comfort and your peace. Lord, the testimony of Jesus, even just what I mentioned, 
in John 11, where Jesus, you know what it's like. You wept at the tomb of your friend Lazarus, Lord. And so, uh, God, I just pray you would be in that situation and give them all they need. And I pray that a testimony of your goodness could come through this as well too, Lord. That even at the time of Chris's passing, that, that, that the Lord was good to us. The Lord comforted us. The Lord was near us, Lord. I pray for that testimony in that situation, Lord. And Lord, I pray for, um, I pray for Scott, uh, and Krista knows, who's, who's lost his brother, his older brother, Lord, just abruptly. And Lord, and the funeral has already happened, but he's, uh, Lord, uh, he's not doing well. And Lord, that's, that's understandable, Lord, with the shock of grief and the shock of death. And Lord, I pray you'd especially minister to him, Lord. I pray you'd put people into his life as well, too that he can open up his heart to, Lord, that he can, he can get out and let out his grief, Lord. And um, in, in whatever way, Lord, I pray for the right ministers and counselors just to come by him, Lord, so that he doesn't stay stuck in, uh, doesn't stay stuck in imprisoned in his grief, Lord, and just he can get it out, Lord. And I pray that he, uh, he and all those who are grieving, Lord, would not be in a rush to feel better, Lord. Um, I don't know, sometimes that's maybe the pressure we feel, Lord, or the message, you know, we, we hear to, to get over something when we're not ready to get over it, Lord. So I pray just for a healthy grieving time for Scott and for the other families we mentioned as well, too. But I also pray for, um, for the family that's grieving Jerry, Chris's, uh, Chris's uncle, and also for, for Katie, his, his wife who's left behind and who's, who might not make it to Christmas as well. Lord, there's uh, many needs there, Lord. I pray for, for her to be comforted in her grief, Lord, but I also pray for her own life and her just health and well-being and salvation, Lord. Lord, may she know you in this time. May she make it to Christmas, Lord, but may she, she make it to eternity, knowing you as her Savior. Will you especially intervene, Lord, when, uh, Lord, sometimes when we're grieving, also our hearts are open and vulnerable in a good way, Lord. Uh, we're open to you. Lord. And Lord, I pray your grace and truth and peace and comfort um, would come into, into Katie's heart in this situation, Lord. Lord, I pray for, for Vance, who's, who's sick, who's still sick, Lord, who's now missed two Sundays in a row, and just something that, some virus, something attacking his, his congestion in his throat, Lord, and just, it won't go, Lord. But we command it to go in the name of Jesus, Lord. We pray for healing, advance his body. Will you restore him to health, Lord, and restore him to our fellowship, Lord. Lord, and for anyone else who's sick in the congregation, I, I know of him being sick, but there may be a few others who are just dealing with, with seasonal colds, flus, and viruses. Jesus, I believe that there's healing in your name. In the name of Jesus, we can be healed of, of small things and of big things, Lord. So just pray for healing from sickness for anyone who needs it, Lord. Pray for Hannah, for Shirley's granddaughter as well, that she would uh, get her voice back. And, uh, yeah, just be able to, to fully uh, sing and, and talk again, Lord, whatever virus is uh, affecting her. I pray that that would also be expelled in the name of Jesus, Lord. Lord, I pray for Suzanne. I pray for her health. I pray for the... Uh, for the uh, CT scan coming up on Tuesday. Lord, I pray for a good report, or if there's, if there's anything still affected in her body, I pray that the doctors would learn how to treat it and deal with her and just restore her back to, to full health, Lord. And I just pray for her for full and complete healing in Jesus' name and comfort and peace for Suzanne as well. Just make everything right in her body, we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for, for Lynn and for Trevor, Lord, just that the the mother and the man who was shot through the head, Lord, and who survived. Lord, Lord we, we give thanks, Lord, for, for his, his protection, Lord, for his deliverance from that, Lord, a man who just a, was a bystander who had nothing to do with the situation, just at the right, you know, wrong place at the wrong time, it looks like, Lord. Lord, I pray for his full healing. Um, great damage was done, Lord, but the doctors have been able to work. Lord. And God, I pray you would be able to complete that work of healing. Lord. Restore him to health, Lord. I just, it's hard to imagine what a testimony that he may have one day. Like, I was once shot through the head, and I survived by God's grace and deliverance, and he healed me, Lord. So, uh, God, do what only you can do in that situation. And will you comfort Lynn as well, too, Lord, and just let her know that just her life and her son's life right, is in your hands, Lord, that you are watching over everything, and you are in control of all things. And, Lord, we give thanks with, uh, with Sam and Dolores for your provision and for the, the testimony, for the faithfulness of your word, Lord, um, that if we just ask... Uh, uh, the, our Heavenly Father, Lord, you will provide. So thank you, Lord, for the double provision of a, of a seven-passenger vehicle for them, Lord. Thank you just for that's a, a load off their mind. It's just a worry they don't have to worry about anymore, Lord. Thank you for your goodness and grace. Lord. 
And to pray for a blessed visit for, this, for the family, Lord, and just ease of travel and pray they can get here safely and have a wonderful time, Lord. Pray for those others who are traveling, Lord, who are about to travel. And I think uh, Sam and Dale, I think of Elizabeth, I think of Donna Corbett, and there's, there's probably some others as well, too. I'm just going to give them traveling mercies as they go to, to different places. And Lord, in all these requests, all these prayers we bring before you, and we lay them out before you in, in Jesus' name. We thank you for hearing our prayer, God. Amen. Okay, I'll release the children now for Sunday school. And uh, yeah, bless the, the teachers and the work, the preparations they've done. Looks like we have about five or six. And I don't think it's my microphone that's crackling. I don't know if there's anything else that's still on that we know of. Okay, with something. Okay, just, Lord, we pray for resolution there. Okay, so uh, Mark and Elena, are you you doing the Advent reading for the candle? Okay, I'll sit down. I'll let you stand up and do what you got to do. God is good. What a collaboration. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read from uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2, and then 6 to 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness on them has light shine. Six and seven. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from the time forth and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Okay. Thank you, Mark, Elena, Lawrence, the teamwork going on. Okay. If I could get to my, yeah, the message series, please. Okay, yeah, we're good. Although, yeah, I guess that's my first one before the title. Okay. 
So first, uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then uh, a different verse as well each week. Oh, as I see Ben, could you please come up and pray over me? Oh, Heavenly Father, again, we're so thankful to be here, Lord. We're so, thank- we're so looking forward to what it is you have to reveal to us through the, the message that you've given Vince this week, Lord. So may it go forth and do all it's intended to do, Lord, and give you glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. So, yeah, we were talking about the gospel, which is good news. The forgiveness of sins through the death of Jesus Christ bringing reconciliation to the Father and resulting in new life by the Holy Spirit. And Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Okay. So, oh, and I have that. No, I don't. So this week, just a, an Advent-themed one from John 1. Um, he dwelt among us. Reading from John 1, 1 to 18. And so, uh, as you know, in John's gospel, John doesn't have any of the Christmas story. He more goes big picture. He talks about Jesus being sort of in eternity with the Father, okay, and then Jesus coming to earth. He kind of just, he doesn't have all the details of, of the shepherds and the angels of that and such, which we find in the other gospels. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. That's John the Baptist. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, gave the right to become children of God, Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, or or dwelt among us in some translations. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning Him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have received grace in place of grace already given, or grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. This is the word of the Lord. But just as we get into the Advent season and anticipate Christmas, I just thought I would do at least one message on on the Incarnation, on on Jesus coming to earth, that God became a man and he took on human form. And we read that in verse 14 today, the Word became flesh. Or in the New Living Translation, uh, the Word became human. And where you sometimes also hear this is in some of the Christmas carols we sing. Actually today, you know, come all, all ye faithful. It's a word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. Okay, there's the incarnation. And if you know also in Hark the Herald Angels Sing, one of the lines in there, Veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. So it's, it's in some of our, our Christmas carols as well too, that God became a man, came to earth in the person of Jesus. And Jesus was fully God and fully human while he was on this earth. And I, I know that theologians over the centuries have tried to kind of figure that out. You know, how did that work, that he had a, a divine nature and a human nature? 
And I just remember some of my courses in sem seminary, we looked at that, some of the, the writings that people uh, looked at. We didn't try to solve that problem, but it's, it's, it's always been a bit of a mystery. Like, wow, he was fully God and he fully human. Yes, he was. And I think it's going to remain somewhat of a mystery for us. But it's also a miracle. Okay, it is a miracle that God came to earth in human form and, uh, and lived among us. If you know, if you've ever read anything by C.S. Lewis, he has a book called Miracles. And he just talks about miracles in general and the skepticism that people have. Like, well, I don't really believe in miracles because of this, you know, because of this, this, and that. And so he deals with it very well if you read any of his writings. But he makes a point in there that, okay, a blind man seeing, that's, that's kind of hard to believe. He was blind and then he could see. Or the miraculous, you know, multiplication of food. You know, there's, there's 12 buns, you know, laid out and it feeds, you know, 200 people. Okay, that's hard to believe. Like, you can be skeptical about that. But God becoming a man, okay, coming to earth. That's the greatest miracle of all. Like, if that's the greatest of his miracles. If you can believe that, then all those other things are kind of small, you know, because like, that is the miracle. Um, so I... I, I take that point. It's, it's almost the greatest miracle of all the miracles God has done, or just the, the one that wows us, like, God, you came to earth in human form. And so I pray that we can recapture some of the wonder of this as well. I know we know the good news that Jesus came to earth, but I want us to know the good news and have the wow of it. Wow, God, you came to earth. Because there's a very clear message in the Bible, like Isaiah 66, verse 1. Okay, you know, for God, heaven is his throne, and the earth is his footstool. So God lives in heaven. That's his place. And we're here on earth. That's our place. So God is there, and we're here. And yet the wonder of it all is that God came from heaven to be with us, to join us in our place. And so, um, and he came not in strength and forcefulness, not this time anyway, he will. He came humbly as a baby and as a servant. God coming to earth. And so this is what I want to look at today, just the outline. I want to look at the blessing of Jesus coming to us. And I want to look at the, the credibility, the understanding, and the sympathy that that gives him. Well, that's very personal for us. And third, I want to look at how Jesus shows us the Father, because that was in our reading today as well, too. So the first is the blessing of Jesus coming to us. So Jesus coming to earth in human form is a way of God speaking to us. Okay. As I said in the last message, there are many ways that God has spoken and can speak. He speaks through his word. Um, he speaks through his creation. He th speaks um, through prophets, you know, angels, messengers, visions. There's many ways that God can speak. But something special happened at Christmas is that God came in person. Right. And I, I came across that phrase, I was just reading an article once on the incarnation, just that simple way of putting it. God came in person, okay? God himself came. He's used messengers, angels, prophets before, but God himself came to earth. It's like a personal visit to us. And the book of Hebrews, it, it starts with that theme, kind of picks up on this. It says, uh, verses one and two, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. So God has spoken in many different times, many different ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, Jesus, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. Okay. And in that passage in John as well, too, we read today, there's sort of a famous phrase, you know, he dwelt among us. Though I think the NIV says, you know, he made his dwelling among us. But I'm, you know, my title, and in many translations, it's he dwelt among us. And if you look at those words, too, just even the different English translations or study a bit of the Greek, it's like he made our home among us, okay? I remember once um, a pastor preaching on this, and we were, uh, we were actually at church camping. This was on Vancouver Island. And so we were in this group site, and so kind of everyone had their tent kind of in this circle, this all, in this, this ring around there. And the illustration that he made was when Jesus came to earth, it was like he pitched his tent among us. So there's my tent, there's this person's tent, you know, and there's Jesus just, you know, taking up residence and making up his home with us. It, it's that personal. Um, that he came and dwelt among us. So this is an all-powerful, all-knowing God spending time with us. If you know of the five love languages, you know quality time is one of them, okay? Spending time with someone is a way of showing you love them, 
Okay, and that's what Jesus did for us. There's a story in Luke 24 as well. There's the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And they're walking with Jesus, and he's opening the scriptures to them. They don't know it's Jesus. At, at that point, he hasn't revealed himself, or it hasn't been revealed to them. Um, but he's telling them all these things. And at a certain point in the evening, they want to stop. But Jesus makes it look like, or he, it looks like Jesus intends to keep on going. And what they say is, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. Luke 24, 29. And Jesus does. Okay, he answers that request. Stay with us. And he does. So that's what God has done. He's come to us and he's stayed with us here on earth. I mean, if you look at Jesus' ministry as well, too. I mean, a lot of times he's going from place to place. He's going from one village to another. So Jesus is on the move. There's usually a crowd following him. But if you read, you see very often as well, um, he'll stop. He'll pause. Say, what does this person need? He'll have compassion on someone. Someone will call out to him for help. And Jesus will be walking along, and he'll hear the call. Okay, what does this person need? Like blind Bartimaeus in Mark 10. He calls out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stops, says, okay, call him forward. What do you need? What would you like? And then he's blind. He says, I want to see. And Jesus heals. Okay. So you see Jesus in his ministry as well. He's, he's got a mission. He has a purpose. His face is set like flint at one point. Okay, but he stops, takes time, takes time, pauses, and, uh, and spends time with us and meets us according to our need. Okay, so that's the first blessing. Jesus just coming to us and spending time with us. Okay. And perhaps there's even a bit of a picture of something that was lost that we had before the fall as well, too. Because if you read in Genesis 3, it says that God walked in the garden. Okay, now at this point, where, when that reference is made, um, Adam and Eve are hiding from him because the, they've already eaten from the forbidden fruit. But you get a picture there that God used to walk in the garden with Adam and Eve. Okay? And then after the fall, okay, then Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden. And there's some sort of separation now because of sin. There's sort of a broken fellowship. Okay? So Adam and Eve used to walk with God, and then after the fall, um, now they can no longer walk with God in the same way. So there's a separation that happened in Genesis 3. But Jesus coming to earth... Okay? It's, it's almost a way of bridging the gap again. Okay? He's sort of un, partially at least undone that separation, although uh, the, the fulfillment of that won't happen until Revelation. So there was a separation, but now Jesus, God in human form, comes back to us. Um, I'll tell you about the, what the future promises. Revelation 21.3. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them. So that will happen one day in glory. When all is made right, okay, God will be among us again. But there's already a picture, already a foretaste of Jesus you know, walking this earth with us, living side by side with us. So Jesus spent personal time with us. God came, um, not a prophet, not an angel, but God himself. That's the first sort of aspect of the blessing. And now I want to talk about the, the credibility and the understanding and the sympathy of Jesus. And I'll start with a picture. And I don't know if you've ever, if you've heard of Habitat for Humanity. Okay, and some of the, okay. So one of the things they do on their mission trips is, yeah, some people, maybe people have been involved in this, but I know some teams that have went. So what they'll do is they'll, they'll, they'll go to a developing nation and, um, and they'll organize the building of a house for someone in need. And so you can join them, you can come with a team, and, and the person, uh, like the family, is maybe living in some shack. Like they don't have adequate housing. And so a team comes and then, Sometimes it can be done in four or five days, just, just a week. They build a new house for that person and then present to them, here's your house. And it's a very moving time, too, because this family that was homeless or, or didn't have a good home, I mean, often it's a single mom, and they just identify the need that way. Now they have a home. It's like, wow. So that'd be a blessing to be a part of that team, to go and come and build a home for someone, and now they have a home. But let me add another layer to it. What if before building that home for someone, you went and you lived with them for a week, for a month? Okay, if they're living in some sort of shack, what if you first understood their need? Okay, you live with them, you fully understand, okay, these people need a new home. This won't do. And then you go and build the home. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with not doing it that way. But you see the understanding and the sympathy that would be there if you first lived in their home, saw their need, and then help to build in their home. 
And I use that as a picture of Jesus, just living with us, okay, living a human life, and then going and saving humanity. We know that he lived for about 30 years before he began his public ministry. So uh, we don't really know any of the details of that, except that you know, he, he lived a normal life. Okay? He knows what it is to be human, and he understands the human condition. And I referenced earlier before prayer as well too, John 11, verse 35. Okay? Jesus weeps over a friend who has died. Okay? He's experienced that grief of losing a friend. Um, and I think there's a picture of our salvation story in there too. Because if you see that in, the, in there as well, Jesus comforts the sisters, okay? He weeps with them, he grieves, he understands. But then he says, but then he, he also then becomes the remedy for them. He says, okay, Lazarus is dead. That shouldn't be, okay? Death was never my father's plan. This was never the intention of my father. And so then he comes and says, you know, goes to the grave and says, Lazarus, come out. Okay. But before him doing that, before him sort of raising Lazarus from the dead, Okay, he first understands what it is to grieve, what it is to lose a friend. He kind of deliberately, voluntarily walks through that. And so I think I would see that as a picture of our salvation as well, too. Jesus comes to save us through, from our sins. But first, he lives you know, 33 years within sinful humanity to kind of know what it's like, to know the problem that he's come to solve. See, our God is omniscient. Right? He's all-knowing. He knows everything. But it's something a little different to say that he has experienced everything we've experienced, right? Um, on that, I remember a testimony I heard on the radio once. Like a fellow was giving his testimony about his, his problem with God and how he came to God. And, and at one point, he's calling out to the Lord in prayer because, okay, this man had lost a son. He lost a son, car accident or something. And he said to God very openly, do you know what it's like to lose a son? And he just caught himself right there. Like, he does. All right? He knows the grief of it. He's experienced that grief. And that just, that was what, what turned him, what turned him to God. Okay? Not that his grief wasn't there, but we have a God who, who can grieve, who has grieved, who's experienced it. So he understands our overall problem. He understands our emotions. Um, and Jesus is someone you can talk to as well because he's been through whatever you've been through. He's called a man of sorrows familiar with grief and acquainted with suffering. Isaiah 53, verse 3. Okay? So Jesus knows. He understands our need. It's a blessing given to us. The Apostle Peter teaches on this as he encourages his readers to be patient in suffering. It is one of the calls throughout Scripture. Be patient in suffering. And he uses the example of Jesus. Peter says, He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. Okay. So are you suffering? Jesus knows about that. Are you being persecuted and falsely accused? Okay, that's hard to deal with. Okay. But Jesus has dealt with that. He knows how to deal with that. He's been through that. Um, Jesus knows what it's like to be betrayed. Okay. And he was troubled. Okay, John 13, 21. Okay, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to be, betray me. So Jesus has been through the hard experiences that we've been through. And I guess my, my prayer in revealing that is that you can find him as someone who understands. Okay, Jesus, what I'm going through, you know what I'm going through. You've been there. Now help me, sustain me, comfort me in that. Um, and let me continue just with this idea of just credibility. It's the theme of this point. You've all had different bosses in your life probably that you've worked for and, and some were, were maybe good bosses and maybe some were, were okay, but um, you want a boss who's fair and who's, who's competent, who knows their job, who they appreciate you. But I think I've said this before a couple of weeks ago. One great quality in a boss is someone who used to do the work that you're doing now, right? So they used to do what you're doing and then they got promoted to be manager or supervisor and now everything they're calling you to do, they've already done it. So they understand. And they understand the, the difficulties sometimes that come up. And they understand also the joys of the job also. Okay? So there's a credibility if they're asking you to do something that they've already done themselves. And that's the same with Jesus. Okay? Because he knows the righteousness you were called to. Okay? And he knows the temptation that you have to deal with. Okay? He says to you, I'm an expert. 
on what you're supposed to do. That's righteousness, because he lived a righteous life. And I understand what gets in the way, because Jesus was tempted. It's found in other places as well, but there's a couple of verses in Hebrews about this, focusing on the humanity of Jesus. So Hebrews 2, verse 18. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Okay? Because of the experience he went through, he can do that. Then Hebrews 4.15, very similar. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who was tempted in every way that we are, yet was without sin. So there's understanding, there's sympathy, and there's help. Okay? Because he's went through that. Because he battled temptation and he remained sinless. And because he's the power in your life, okay, which can defeat sin. Okay, Jesus is there to help you. Okay, but there's something just of extra understanding he has because he went through that. So that's the message of just you know, credibility, understanding, sympathy. Jesus knows what you're going through. Okay? Very simply, he understands and he can help. Okay? Isn't that good news? Jesus understands your condition, your, your, um, your problems, the things you deal with, and he is the help. Okay. Jesus is called many things because he has many titles. But one of them is the man from heaven. Okay? He's from heaven, but he became a man. Okay? So that's, the, um, that's 1 Corinthians 15, verse 47. He's from heaven. Again, that's his home. Okay? He lives in heaven. Okay? But he came here to earth on our behalf in order to save us. I don't often quote hymns, um, but there's one that just came to mind as I was writing this too, from Charles Wesley, And Can It Be? I won't sing it or read it, which I don't know if that disappoints or if that relieves. But anyway, he left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all, immense and free, for oh my God, it found out me. So he left heaven. And he came to earth and to save us. That's Jesus. Okay. And third, I want to talk about how he shows us the Father, Jesus coming to earth. And by extension, he shows us what it is to be a son, what it is to be a child of God. Okay, verse 18, the last verse of our reading today. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Okay, and that's a major theme of John's gospel. Okay, if you know Jesus, you know the Father. And in some of the debates he has with the Jewish leaders as well, too. If you love the Father, okay, you'll recognize Jesus when he comes. There's a lot of contention about this, the relationship between the Father and the Son. And in one instance, Jesus says very famously, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's John 14, 6. And in response to that, one of the disciples, Philip, kind of has... Well, just show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And you know Jesus' answer to him? Do you know me? Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus says, John 14, verse 9. So very similar to what we read today. Do you want to know what your heavenly Father is like? See Jesus. Okay. If, you've known, if you know Jesus, you know the Father. And later on, Jesus says in John 15, 9, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Okay. So do you want to know what the Father's love is for you? Do you want to know what it's like? Okay. Receive the love of Jesus. Okay. That's how the Father loves you. And I know we get to some aspects of the Trinity here. They're separate persons. They have separate roles. Okay, it's Jesus who goes to the cross. It's the Father who gives up his Son. Um, but the love of God for you is shown fully in Jesus, okay, and fully in the Father, okay. And I guess what would unite the, yeah, a word that would, would unite both of them is, I will give up whatever it takes in order to save you. Both the Father and Son said that at the cross. I will give up. I will pay whatever it costs to save you. And Jesus brings that to us. Because Jesus brings the Father to us and makes him known. 
And there's probably different ways of expressing it. I probably can't pin it down with one word or one sentence. Like Jesus reveals the heart of the Father, and he shows us the love of the Father, and he brings us the heart of the Father. He carries the heart of the Father. All these things, okay, many ways of describing. But the summary of it is because of Jesus, we now know God as Father. We have access to him, and, um, and he brings the love of the Father. Another way that Jesus reveals the Father is from his ministry because he teaches us what it's like to be a child of God in a very practical way. And probably where you see this most emphasized is in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5-7. to And this is part of Sam and Dolores' testimony too. But for example, this is Jesus teaching you on how to be a child of God. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And then also, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Matthew 6, 31 to 33. And then there's the other reference in there too, referencing them just about, yeah, if, if you, you, yeah, if you, you who are evil know how to good gifts, give good gifts to your children, then how much more does your father know how to give gifts, good gifts to you if you ask for them? So anyway, from this, since God is your father, this is how you are to live. That's what Jesus teaches us, how to be a child of God in very practical ways that Jesus reveals. And Jesus modeled that as well in his own life on earth. Okay, he never stopped being a son. We looked at that a few weeks ago. He came to serve. He took on the role of a servant. But Jesus showed what it was like. He had constant dependence on the Father, constant relationship and connection with him. So he never had stopped being a son. And he showed us how to do that as well. So Jesus again, brings the heart of the Father, again, and he teaches you what it's like to be a child of your heavenly Father. Okay? And there's a single word which kind of pulls this all together in the New Testament, and that's adoption. So Jesus brings about our adoption. And we read today, verses 12 and 13. I would say before that, we join the family of God through Jesus. It's through Jesus that we join the family of God. Verses 12 to 13, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. So born of God. There's our rebirth in there. Okay, talk about you know, baptism, born again. Um, it's, it's not a natural birth we're having. It's a supernatural rebirth. And how do we come about that? Through faith in Jesus. By putting your trust in him, giving your life to him. Similar words in Galatians 3.26. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. Okay, that's how you become a child of God. You put your trust in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. I know some families who have adopted, and maybe you do too. Uh, you just know of that scenario. Remember there was a family, um, my last church in Orangeville, they were adopting an orphan from the Ukraine. And when there's an adoption going on, it's, it's a happy occasion. It's a celebration, right, uh, for, for both parties, for the family who's adopting, and uh, for the child as well, uh, if they're you know, old enough, conscious enough to know that they're being adopted. And that's the same in the family of God, too. It's a celebration. It's a celebration of God, you know, you, you coming into the family of God. And it's a celebration for the person entering. But when that adopted child joins the family, from that first day, what they begin to learn is how to be a part of this family. Okay, what are the, how does this family operate? Uh, what's the, this family's way of doing things when you become part of a family? So it's true just in the natural, in a human family, and it's true in God's family. From day one, you begin to learn what is it like to be part of this family. And just imagine there was a sibling in that family, okay, who could say to the child, you know, let me show you what it's like to be a part of this family, like a brother or sister who was there, okay. And, um, and that's who we have in Jesus, right? Jesus shows you what it's like to be a child of your heavenly father. He will teach you what it's like to be part of the family. And I know... Uh, a lot of you have been in that family, for the family, for a long time and have already learned it. But it's Jesus who continues to show you that. So, through knowing Jesus, we already get a vision and a picture of how we will be. Because the word says, and I read this last week, 
we're all being conformed into the image of the Son. One day we will be like Jesus. Romans 8, 29, and also 2 Corinthians 3, 18. In uh, 1 John 3, 2, there's a lot of talk about that as well, about being adopted. And actually, verse 1 talks about see or behold what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. That's verse 1. And then verse 2 says, Dear friends, now we are children of God. Okay, good news. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. So there's some revelation now of Jesus about what we're going to be like. But one day we will see him face to face. And we will be fully like him. Okay, that's the promise. You know, we will be like Jesus one day. So because he came to earth... You know, first we get to be in relationship with him. Okay? But then also we get to learn what it is to be like him more and more as the, as the Spirit of God conforms you into the image of the Son. One day we'll be perfect. Okay? No one here is perfect, including me. But one day we will be perfect. That is the promise of Scripture. We'll be like Jesus. Okay? And one of, the, one of the benefits of this too is inheritance. You know, we're gonna, we're, it's, it's that official. Okay? We're co-heirs with Christ. We will inherit um, when he inherits. Okay, that's just how firmly God says, you're part of the family now. You inherit with him. So it just says, as a summary of just bringing the Father, I think it's, it's maybe even more than this, but it's at least a double role, a double purpose of Jesus. Okay? First, I will show you the Father, and then I will show you, I will teach you what it is to be a child, you know, a son of God. And all of this from his life here on earth. And all because he walked among us. Um, I mean, there's other things going on. There's the salvation of the world. There's the, there's the defeat of the devil as well. Too. It's, it's, a, it's a big picture of all the purposes of God with Jesus being here on earth. But a, a major aspect of it is the family ministry of reconciling us, bringing us back to our Heavenly Father and bringing us part of the family again. Okay. Now lastly, there's a certain tension if you read through the whole biblical story. There's almost two competing messages, I might call them. Uh, because on the one hand, there's a word about God that says, stand back, keep your distance, don't approach. Okay? Uh, you get the, you know, he's a holy God, don't come close. All these restrictions about access. And you certainly see that in the Old Testament. But it's, it's also uh, written in 1 Timothy 6, 16 in the New Testament. God dwells in unapproachable light. And no one can see him. So all throughout the Bible, stand back, keep your distance. But there's another message in the Bible that says, come close, draw near. Right? Uh, James 4, verse 8, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. So there's almost this tension, stand back, come close. Okay? What solves that dilemma? It's Jesus. Okay? Because of Jesus. Okay? Because he came to us. Now he's come close, we're close with him. And now we can approach. Okay, our God is still a holy God. Okay, that hasn't changed. So all those words about you know, God, you know, God dwelling in holiness. Um, but through Jesus, we now have access to our Heavenly Father. So uh, Hebrews 10, verses 20 and 22. By a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. So now we can approach God. Now we can come close to him. Because Jesus came to us, now we can come to the Father and know him as our Heavenly Father and know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And one day he's coming back for us. You know that. John 14, verse 3. So I go to prepare a place for you. you know? I'm going to come back and I'm going to take you to where I am. So that's the promise as well, too. There's, again, there's a, a one day, like a, a full fulfillment of this. But in the incarnation, we see a Jesus who's come to us and who spent time with us. So there's the blessing of him coming to us, you know, spending time. There's the blessing of knowing what it is to be human. Every struggle you're going through, um, grief, you know, temptation with sin, whatever, just Jesus has been through that. He has suffered the same way that you have suffered. Okay? But he can also help you through that, and he has that credibility. And lastly, then through faith as well, through faith in him, we're adopted into the family of God, and we can know him as Heavenly Father. Okay? Let us pray. 
So thank you, God, for the, the wonder of the incarnation. And Lord, even as, as I said, even though we're used to the news you know, that Jesus you know, came to earth as a baby, Lord, Lord, I pray we'd have that wonder, like, wow, God came to earth. God who lives in heaven came down to earth and lived a human life and dwelt among us, Lord, for those 33 years you were on this earth, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You spent time with us. Um, you, you made time for us. You stopped for people. And you met their needs, Lord. You grieved with people. Um, but then you also brought the remedy of resurrection, as we see at Lazarus' tomb. And thank you, Jesus, for the credibility that that gives you. Let us pray that in, in a new way, Lord, we would just be able to trust you. That if we're suffering with something, we know that, Jesus, you also suffered. That you're a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Lord. And help us to confide in you, open our hearts to you but also find the comfort and the help and the peace that you bring. Thank you, Jesus, that whatever comes against us, you've defeated it, Lord. Jesus, you suffered these things, but you overcame. That there's victory in you that we read today, Romans 8. We are more than conquerors, Lord. So thank you for that, Jesus. May we know that. But may we first come to you as well, Lord, and um, turn to you as someone who understands. And thank you, Jesus, that you, you bring the Father to us. That now we have access to our Heavenly Father, Lord. You've made a way. You've paid for our sins. We are forgiven, Lord. And thank you as well that you show us what it is to be a son or to be a child of God. Lord. And we learn just how to, how to relate to our Heavenly Father, Lord, by Jesus, by what you did and by what you teach us. Everything just even from Matthew 6 as well, too. Your Heavenly Father knows that you know these things. So thank you for those words of encouragement, Lord. Lord, just help us just to, uh, yeah, to really apprehend these truths, Lord. Just press them deep down into our heart. Lord, let's live in the peace of knowing we have a heavenly Father in heaven who loves us. And we have a Savior, Jesus Christ, who knows what it's like uh, um, to be human, but who also died for us, you know, and is coming back for us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we invite the team up for one more, for a closing song. Then I will pray a benediction. And then um, for prayer team, the person who was scheduled is not here, so I wonder if I can get a volunteer to be on the team with me this week. Okay, Elena, okay, thank you. Okay, I think, Ben, you are on, but I think you took my place a couple weeks ago. So anyway, so after the benediction, up at the front here, where it's usually a little bit quieter and reserved, if you need prayer for any reason, for something small or something big, we'd love to bring it before the Lord for you.
and sing this octopel all this time. Lord, I give you my heart. I give, I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm awake. Lord, have your way in me. Bless you, Lord. Thank you, worship team, for, for this song and, and the other five, too. Go now with God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 Have a blessed Sunday. Love to see you at 6.30 tonight as well, too. Just for more worship, focused worship.